So thanks everybody. Uh, I know that we are the seven people between you and your dinner. So we will try to make sure that we uh, utilize the time in the best possible way. So thanks to the panel first of all for agreeing to be uh, on the panel at the end of the day after a grilling, for some of the speakers, a very, very grilling day, basically. So, the idea of this panel is basically uh, twofold. Uh, one is that <coughs> we don't want to get too technical unless there are people and uh, who want to get down to brass tacks. But we want people to leave with when and how to use big data techniques and what are the tools and what are the pitfalls, end of the day, which we should be aware of. So having said that, uh, so I'll just go very briefly over the panel members. So, sorry. So we have Kalpana, who is founder of uh, uh, MetaHome here, and she has kindly agreed to be here in spite of her injury. So thanks again. Uh, and she is from the biosciences uh, world, basically. And she has a chemistry background. So. Uh, so we will get a completely different view uh, from her side. We have Rohit, uh, Rohit Chhatra from Yahoo. And he is basically part of the team which is modeling the, uh, the star model on the grid, which is growing pretty much up to the one petabyte very soon. Okay. We have Prithvijit, who has a distinguished background in analytics in terms of uh, his work at HP, in terms of his work at Genpact. So we, will, uh, we are hoping that he will provide a business angle to a lot of thinking uh, that we basically discussed today. We also have, I'm sure many of you attended Anand's talk uh, today, uh, so who brings in a comp different perspective on a lot of things. And he has a background again in analytics, uh, and uh, you can look, at a, look up his, most of his work on his blog, basically srn.net at this point of time. Then we have Navjot Sidhu, who, uh, from PayPal, so, who has uh, basically, who is responsible for basic, uh, the big data platform discussion or platform decisions at PayPal. And he, is, he has experience in various other things also. And we are hoping for some of the, uh, what, we, what, 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 what one would call as, uh, straight talk from him, uh, as he uh, actually mentioned in his uh, session also. Is there one answer to everything? So I think that's... Then we have Joydeep, uh, Joydeep Sam Sharma, who is presently heading Cubol India. He is a ex-Facebook, ex-Hive creator uh, amidst us. So we are hoping that he can provide the inputs in terms of the size of the data uh, that uh, people have to handle it when they say large data or big data. And he can also point out uh, the challenges in terms of handling that data. So having said that, so we have a set of four questions that we are going to ask. And we are hoping once we finish those questions, if there are questions from the audiences, we will basically take them up. We have time limit of about 45 minutes. Yep. So let's go ahead with the first question. And first question is directed to all the members. So please, I think there is a mic. Uh, Hello. This is working. Okay. So yeah, we keep this here. And if it doesn't work, we'll take that. So the first question is very simple to the panel members. So what is the problem that you guys are trying to solve? which involve usage of the large data? Very open-ended question. And since we have a varied panel member, we are hoping that we can get all the different uh, varied use cases so that people can walk back saying, these are the places possibly I can look at. So yeah, go ahead. So Kalpana can start and then we can go ahead on. Yeah, sure. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, so what we basically are doing at Metaom is, we are actually helping biologists make sense of all the data that is coming out in life sciences these days. 
And when I say biologists, we're talking about people here who don't really ever want to write a line of code or do any kind of scripting. So that is the audience that we are uh, sort of addressing. Uh, so when you look at data itself, it's a pretty boring thing to look at. I mean, it doesn't tell you much. What really becomes interesting is when you start mining the relationships in this data. And that is really what we are attempting to do, and that is where we find a lot of challenges. So there are two kinds of relationships. You have, you know, things that are explicitly stated, like, you know, your name is such and such, or, and then you have implicit relationships or inherent relationships which are not so explicitly stated. For example, if I said that somebody was, you know, Mary was Sue's daughter and Barbara was Mary's mother, then, you know, you have a granddaughter-grandmother relationship which was never explicitly stated. It's the same way in biology. So it is mining that which is really interesting in the life sciences and it is there where people start seeing new patterns, new uses uh, for, you know, uh, drugs, chemicals, compounds. And there's a whole lot of new insights and hypotheses that comes up. So what are our challenges? I mean, there are, there are a lot of uh, challenges here. Biological data is very, very complex. Uh, inherently, you know, because it is scientific data that is coming out. And the second big thing is this data actually sits in silos. So if you look at each silo of data that is coming out, the data actually has a different context. And by different context, I mean if you look at a planet, say Neptune, it means one thing to the astrophysicist and something else to the astronomer. Biological data is like that. It means something to the physician, something else to the molecular biologist. So when this data sits in silos, you might be talking about the same thing, but how do you make this data interoperable and connected? That is the second sort of big issue. The third issue complication is this data is actually completely unnecessary, but created by the scientist itself. Every guy who works with a gene gives it a new name. Every guy who works with a protein gives it a new name. They say that like biologists will share their toothbrush, but they won't share their gene names. <laughs> so this is like inherently just one of those eccentricities of the scientists that have caused this. So these are the sort of issues that we deal with, just connecting the data and making sense of it. These are all the issues that come up with it. But once you've connected it and w once you sort of, you know, uh, put in some level of reasoning and are able to deduce implicit relationships, how do you serve it out? I mean, that is a big issue. You know, these are guys who don't want to write code, and even I wouldn't want to write those huge queries that, you know, would need to be written, right? So how then do you visualize graph data as a query, and how do you serve it out so that you can explore it and explore that nature of that graph? This, these are two issues that I think, you know, we have struggled with, solved to some extent, gone back to the user and found that, you know, there are a lot of other issues. So these are the big things that we've looked okay. at. Great. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, PayPal is, as you all might know, is a payments processing company, right? But um, some of the things that were being said about the complexity of the data, the variance in the data, they just sound very familiar to me too, right? But uh, our problems are also multifaceted, right? Parts of it is real-time decisioning, so an not sort of analytics which can be done offline and in sort of even near real-time, but decisioning that actually drives the business uh, transaction during the actual user's transaction, right? Uh, other parts of our problem are command and control for the site, right? There we have, as I mentioned, billions, hundreds of billions of messages coming through. And these are what determine, uh, you know, if something on the site is working or not working and which part is working, which part is not working, how it can actually be put into a state that can be working. So our problems, uh, even though some of the underlying similarities exist, are perhaps a little more towards um, running the business 
uh, in real time versus trying to find these relationships later. We also have problems in finding the relationships later in terms of if a failure happens, for example, what was the real cause of the failure? So tracing a business transaction all the way from its uh, entrance into PayPal to the time it actually entered into a failed state. Um, that's very important to us. Uh, so problems are multifaceted and they're just aggravated by the scale we, we run at. Uh, in a nutshell, I think that's, that's uh, what we struggle with. Thank you. So what we do at Bridge I2I, uh, we actually try to uh, solve business problems based on data. So we try to go and talk to businesses and many times it's almost a very latent thing that business realizes they have a problem in say their marketing or supply chain or finance. Uh, what they don't realize that it can be solved based on data and analytics. So we try to kind of solve those business problems and challenges of primarily using, uh, trying to uh, see what data is available, being able to augment that data with uh, uh, different forms, uh, may not be just from what's coming from the core systems, maybe in sometimes uh, trying to see uh, what other unstructured data is available, try to marry that. Then trying to think about uh, uh, driving the right level of visualization, even on the current form, uh, because that in many times you would not believe the business probably doesn't have that also. So telling them what's happening is also a big aspect in many cases. And then probably trying to tie back and solve that problem in terms of what they should be doing in future. That's where a lot of data mining, predictive modeling, optimization kind of techniques comes into play. And that's where the techniques become very important for us to understand what techniques will work because the scenarios might be very different. In some cases you might be trying to uh, find out say a patient behavior, some cases it might be a customer behavior, some cases it might be a resource optimization say uh, uh, managing how many beds should be there in a hospital, I'm just kind of uh, uh, making it up but there are different kind of scenarios in which analytics can play a role. Uh, really figuring out uh, how to solve a problem, what kind of techniques will play is another part. And then it comes into implementation to make it real for the business to, to see real value out of it. Uh, where certain contexts, again, some cases might be easy, uh, uh, like it might be fully offline. You give them a strategy, they kind of implement it. When it becomes more real-time uh, implementation, that's even more challenging in many cases because you have to, in a split of a second, uh, you have your algorithm run and make decisions there, say many of the online, uh, say fraud detection, those kind of areas again. So. So the challenge rise probably across the uh, board in terms of data, in terms of what data to use, what kind of visualization should come into play, how do you probably, uh, what techniques should you be using, uh, and how, what's the layer that you show it to the business, how do you implement it. So a variety of those comes into more where we get involved in a project form. Another thing which we are trying to do, uh, still baby steps we are taking, uh, we are trying to build on something what we call our analytics apps, uh, which are really uh, prepackaged solutions in a very specific uh, areas where the business has a solution uh, which they can probably, where they don't have to worry about uh, what techniques, what tools sitting behind it, but it solves their problem again. So, so it's really that's where machine needs to play a lot of work in terms of say there's no data scientist available there but you have to have the technology take a decision in many of those cases and the business has to get almost an idiot proof uh, tool to kind of play with uh, because the business managers are also getting more analytic savvy. So that's a little bit of a different thing because that's where we are marrying technology uh, to quite a bit of extent. Uh, so those are really at a very, very high level, the kind of work we do, the kind of challenges we face in our day-to-day -day kind of work. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rohit from Yahoo. Uh, most of the people know that Yahoo is the biggest publisher and has a wide variety of content. Uh, and with that, we come with a problem of um, multi-billion, like 30 billion plus events and around 20 terabyte a day, 20 to 30 terabyte a day, which kind of presents us with a challenge for close to 600 plus million users, we use uh, the technology to solve the business problems like identifying the user value, uh, generating the user uh, digital genome, so yeah, we call it as digital genome. Uh, by doing that, we are able to um, tell user what story they liked and what would interest them and kind of you know engage them on a Yahoo network and based on their past history, we create a digital signature for that person 
and you know then we know what category he is like if if he's a sports fan or is it like you know shopping um, maniac and stuff like that based on that we are able to actually predict or uh, suggest articles and stories also the same thing can be used for advertiser um, you know uh, uh, trying to advertise their own product to those users who are more uh, you know looking for something so since we have search and the display data all put together the same user actually we have a strong information about a user saying that he also searched for uh, some digital camera and he also browsed through you know some of the sites uh, on the yahoo itself or, or clicked on some of this display as that actually gives a huge huge uh, not only a business challenge to solve but also a good opportunity for us to serve the users where another thing is also identifying um, unique users uh, which is um, most of the people will agree on the digital world as to how to identify a different level like geo level or you know or, or different kind of interest category level because a person can have multiple interest and stuff like that which can actually if if you tell advertisers that you can reach out to say 100 million unique user for sports category that's like an advertiser is just thrilled and if we can target it properly you know they get it so we we try to connect the publisher advertiser and the the content with the user which brings in the whole thing there are other things like scoring algorithm for publisher whether it's for an ad quality score that we create for a user we also we create like a user value so all this thing if put together has a, a multi dimensional problem to be solved and to an extent yahoo has solved the problem uh, to a great extent so yeah. hi i'm anand from gramda the problem we are trying to solve is that <coughs> of helping people understand the results of analysis or data humans are great at language we are not so good I mean, we are born wired for it we are not so good at reading tables of numbers what we are trying to do is tell picture stories out of that to give you an example uh, <coughs> the back of my t-shirt is a chart okay that shows the days on which people were born in india at least according to official records and you'll see that practically nobody is born in august there's a reason for it schools open in june <laughs> and you know most birthdays are adjusted accordingly now it's one thing to show that as a table of numbers it's another thing, thing to say oh okay i've got a full row of august it's completely blank Wh what's that doing so we just tell picture stories we also do analytics of the non traditional kind think of it as bringing free economics to corporates so for example we observe <coughs> that students born in june who just make it into class tend to score consistently lower than students who are born in august who score about 10 percentage points higher we find that said those are cells extremely well with coffee and tea in fact to the point that all they're never ever bought without the other turns out that when you're buying children's clothing the sales of every product moves with every other product with one exception knits jackets that's somehow a very separate category things like this which are interesting that the business might not know these are the kinds of things that we are trying to extract and most most importantly present it in a way that people get the answer instantly um i think uh, uh, so i'll talk about my facebook experience um, very little to add beyond what rohit said so yahoo and facebook are very similar companies and um uh, so i was trying to try and see if i could answer this question differently and i was thinking in my mind why did we hold on to so much data i mean yeah there's a lot of data coming in and you can do stuff with it that sort of like uh, you know you just count stuff show how many page views you got uh, figure out how much advertisers should get billed all the you know standard kind of stuff i think the more interesting question is you know how the hell why the hell were we uh, actually holding on to like 50 petabytes of data or whatever um so uh, and i think the most interesting things that i can think of are the the most interesting use cases are often the ones that you don't know about in in advance right so uh, somebody will ask a question that uh, you don't know the answer to and you've got to go back and like analyze a years worth of data to actually you know figure out right so uh, some kind of cohort analysis or hey you know we adopted the strategy last august you know how did that fare out how did the group of users acquired last august uh, behave over time what was their pattern you know relative to users acquired via other means so to me the most interesting applications are the ones that you don't know about um uh, yeah maybe i should just stop there okay. So thanks. So the next set of question is basically uh, it's more interesting, isn't it? In terms of uh, today, we have got uh, various. I think a lot of you are. How many of you are already using Hadoop ecosystem to doing big data? Okay. 
how many of you are actually using a non Hadoop ecosystem for doing big data? There are a few guys here also. And I think that's the intent of basically finding out if you are using Hadoop or using a non Hadoop or you're using a relational database or an MPP, how do you make that decision end of the day? And if you can go further, and especially in case of uh, uh, Rohit and as well as uh, uh, Jaydeep, is basically if, if you have the details, and even Navjot, if you have the details in terms of what percentage of your analytics and everything would be at a high level, say high pig versus something else at a high level, versus very custom jobs. Or do you encourage that also? What would you encourage at what point of time? So basically the idea is how do you choose that technology platform? So I can go first. I guess uh, just like any other technology decision, right, uh, the first criteria is always the solution has to fit the problem, right? The first requirement is always it must work before anything else, right? So, so even as you go through the solutions, you have to look back and make sure you understand your problem correctly. Right? And you do have to do that continuously. Uh, with respect to sort of applicability in the problems we have in the big data space, right, uh, we have a whole slew of technologies. We have, uh, and it's, this is not to sort of uh, say we, we have a lot of processing on Hadoop, but we have about a 300 node Hadoop cluster. But 5% of analytics actually run on that. Right? Uh, a lot of analytics do run off of uh, Teradata itself. Right, the traditional way, sourced from an OLTP system, which it, for which a relational database is the best fit. You have structured data. You want to run analytics on structured data. Yes, it's massive volumes of it. Right? It's, yes, it's five petabytes of it. But it's structured, and there are certain solutions, traditional solutions that work perfectly fine. Okay. Where we deal with unstructured data, again, uh, like I was going through the talk today, even as we evaluated Hadoop, right? So Hadoop does offer certain advantages for us in terms of being able to leverage cheaper storage, uh, you know, more distributed uh, storage rather than, you know, paying for slightly more expensive disks. But when you sort of do the trade-off between how much custom development we would have to do and how we would actually have to invest in even utilizing that 300 node cluster for some of our semi-structured data, uh, that decision and the fit for it, uh, first of all, right? Uh, th and, and the sort of fit for the problem, meaning if it takes me 30, 45 seconds to get that response back, then that's not a path I'm willing to follow, right? Um, but there's certainly A-B testing, sort of multivariate testing use cases that uh, that's perfect for because that analytics can run after two or three days and that in many cases also is semi-structured data. There's external uh, sort of sources we mine for impressions of PayPal, right? So what are people saying outside uh, on Facebook, on perhaps other blogs, other sites, on Twitter? What are they saying about us, right? Where it's completely unstructured, where it's mining text, right? Where Hadoop does fit well, where, where it makes sense to actually make that investment, right? And we have made that investment. But really what you have to look to is, does this solution solve my problem, right? And you have to continually keep, continuously keep evaluating that as you go through the evaluation of technologies. Uh, and there's multitudes of things out there from, you know, like I talked earlier today, uh, you know, columnar data sources, uh, writing your own custom things. You know, there's all kinds of options outside of Hadoop. And of course, on top of Hadoop, you have all the tool sets like Hive, like uh, you know, any of the other, like pig, other things that make it ma our value add services on top of it, right? But I'll go back and finish by saying that the first and foremost criteria for me is does it solve my problem, right? Does it work? And beyond that, uh, you know, technology choices are like any other technology choice you make. So uh, it's a very good question that how do you choose the technology platform? Uh, if you have, like now just said, if you have an analytics need which can be modeled in a way where it's relational in nature, 
then you have plethora of uh, technology available and tools available to visualize see the data and the way you want to do the data but uh, most of the people will agree on the digital world the requirements for the analytics and probably even at paper is changing so fast that introduction of new dimension I'm, I'm sorry I'm talking about the modeling part but introduction of new dimension or a metric that changes the way you compute or look at the data presents you with the challenge that you know uh, even for that matter, even if Teradata or any other Oracle or whatever you take has its own limitation. Now, for the known analytics that you're going to generate, and it's going to be finite in nature, which they call it as KPIs, because it's not going to change much. Like, for example, for the web, page views, clicks, revenue, and all these things are going to not change. No matter what you do, page views will be asked. So things that are known and are not going to change are our bread and butter to just, like, when you go on analytics dashboard, you should be able to say, I'm doing okay. For those kind of things, you know, a relational system uh, helps. But the moment you go dig deeper and you try to find out and try to create a correlation, say something you know, on, the, on the revenue system, if you have some fraud happening or some robotic thing happening, and you want to try dig deeper and try to see that the variables are related or not, when you do that, the, the way you look at the data changes. It's no more a record. It's, it's a it's, it becomes a logical record, and you have to actually go through uh, either you know using a statistical modeling, predictive modeling, and stuff like that. For example, quality score. The quality score for an ad cannot be just measured based on the click. It has to be measured across geo. It has to be measured across publisher. It has to measure a different type of users and stuff. Now, when you bring all these things together, it becomes a problem of a large data. When you see that your existing system has a boundary defined in a way where it cannot be uh, totally parallel. You know, it cannot be divided into subsets, and each of them does it parallelly and gets back to you. That's when you realize that okay, you know, Hadoop is your uh, is your framework that you need to embark on. Write either a custom map reduce, or you write a pick program, or you know, if it can be modeled, it is high and stuff. Once you know that your existing system is having a boundary, uh, that's when. For example, a lot of people say that you know, I have like a two petabyte of uh, Oracle um, system running. Are you really actually scanning all the two petabyte? That's the question, right? If you are, then probably Oracle will die. Or even on the Teradata side, if you go with two petabyte, it will. Because if a person takes two petabyte and there are 10 people concurrency, it just kills the system, right? So the question is, how much of the data that is online on your RDBMS is really being used? If out of two petabyte, you're using only, say, 10 terabyte, then, you know, go with the RDBMS. But when you know that most of the time you have to scan the large amount of data, like at uh, Yahoo to do a user behavior uh, analysis to see the pattern, how the, the cluster is moving, what is becoming hot, or which keyword is becoming popular, and we have to tell advertiser, okay, start bidding on this, or certain things like that, you know, you, you have to scan. If you have to analyze marketplace, you know, if you have to see how California is reacting to certain news, versus how New York is reacting. Now you, you enter into a space which is very different, right? And you have to have multiple channels to look at it. So that's when you realize that your existing system are not able to scale, and they won't scale because they are not designed for it. That's when you move on to systems like either Hadoop, and if you want a real, real time lookup and some processing, you can go to HBase, Cassandra. But the thing is, you need to, like he said, right? Uh, you need to see that the solution, that the problem that you have fits the bill that the solution that you want to come up. Cheap, I, I don't know whether Hadoop is cheap or not. It again depends on the skill set that you have, the problem that you're trying to solve, because there are many people who have tried to solve a problem for which Hadoop is not made up of. You know, if you don't, if you cannot think of your data as a key value pair, probably, you know, you should think differently. So that's, that's what I'd say. Great. Thank you. Yeah, let me see if I can try and add something here. <laughs> uh, so I, I think one part of the question has uh, not been answered as yes. to high level versus low level. So maybe I can actually try and um, uh, add to that. Um, one thing I've seen is that it's always best to capture problems at the highest level of abstraction. And sometimes that might be a C++ function, sometimes that might be a SQL fragment, and sometimes it might be something um, even much higher than that. So one of my favorite examples is uh, in almost all the companies here, you know, somebody out there in your company must be doing a 30-day uh, average of something, right? Uh, uh, and that guy is writing the same thing that, you know, 100 other people have written. And um, I can give it in writing that many of them will get it wrong and they will cause a lot of burden on the system. So um, that's one principle I like to follow is uh, try and think at the highest level of abstraction. 
how to uh, you know capture what you're trying to do and capture that somewhere because tomorrow when you come and revisit your backend you want to rework something you know that's the thing that you want to reimplement um the other thing i would say is that uh, unfortunately i mean uh, uh, some of us sitting here are from very big companies and uh, i guess a, a lot of people on the other side are also from very small companies and i don't think the same parameters can apply to large company and big com uh, small company so for example when i was working at a very large company i knew i had an army behind me so my job was to make the best technological decisions and i was confident that whatever decisions i made uh, the army would execute on it it will you know fix the problems as long as the design was right we could always implement it right but if you are a small startup in which is my current role you know we, you are aggressively trying to find something that works so uh, you know i think for most of us actually the answer is well let's just try everything aggressively and find what works and keep it and of course you know ask around and like get references i think i mean my experience has been that most of the stuff doesn't work you know it's it's marketing it just sort of like people talk about like cool stuff and uh, things like that but you know a lot of stuff doesn't work so <laughs> that's the only way you find out the other uh, principle that i have sort of seen articulated and i like is that um try and choose uh, small things uh, because um if you choose small components well even if they break then you can replace them with something else uh, but if you choose like uh, big honking systems that you know sort of absorb in everything uh, you know within themselves uh, then well you know you, your your odds of sort of fixing it later are get harder and harder um, so those are the things i can add yeah. so do you want to uh, to see then uh, but you just want to add two lines to what stack do you use so i think it's all covered mostly i think the only uh, point which i would add on is uh, it primarily gets down uh, still i think uh, 90% of the work we do uh, relational database and using analytics on top of that really solves the problem so which analytics package do you basically prefer so i think that's so one of so the so that's again i think going back to his point i think yeah. it from an analytics package standpoint and analytics tool standpoint i think it depends so when obviously i was in hp we would kind of pick up things like sas sps and others which would be probably a standard thing now being a startup again we would rely on a lot more on open source uh, be it r be it python which really kind of things which we uh, try to adopt and they work beautifully well and and the thing is where it works and they, it has you have to make the choice in a different form also uh, like uh, going back to uh, Uh, certain things which are more real time or near real time that's where uh, the non traditional uh, 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 database concepts kind of become very important or even there are choices there also even uh, are you doing the learning of the algorithm real time if not maybe certain traditional methods will probably work very well okay. uh, then the things like uh, probably uh, uh, certain techniques especially when you are using techniques on unstructured data that's where probably a big way you have to think about non traditional uh, databases but in general i think most of the things are kind of covered but using open source as far as possible uh, in terms of techniques r and others are the standard ones which you use quite a bit now. so kalpana do you want to add uh, because your field is completely different from most of the yeah and i'll kind of keep this a little short uh, we decided to go with a graph database simply because we are looking at a very sort of open world system where we're looking at data across several different contexts and very diverse data sources but again as a startup you know a lot of your technology decisions are made based on the problem that you need to solve at hand and your resources so we went with a virtual so stack Uh, one big reason it's open source uh, we have a partnership with them so it it worked out that way so that's basically but for you know for traditional things like housekeeping we use you know regular you know mysql databases or uh, for you know when we do our auto suggest on our ui we would use like an in memory database or a tree so we you know we've been using a mixture of technologies Uh, using what best solves that problem at the risk of actually repeating and duplicating our data to some extent we've sort of tried to find the most economical way to solve this problem yeah. so and do you want to add 
Do you want to add? Yeah, just yeah, a please. few things. So on the analyst analytics stack, here's what I'd suggest. And if you've got it, just start with Excel. And if you need to go deeper, <laughs> go with R. On if you want to move to the programming side, Python seems to be emerging as the de facto standard, mainly because of the power of its libraries, NumPy and NLTK being on the forefront. On the front end, if you want to show it on the browser, <coughs> SVG seems to be the de facto standard again, mostly because it's vector as opposed to raster and you can zoom in. D3.js seems to be the most powerful tool that's emerging today. Great. Thank you very much. I think hopefully that was useful for many of us. So the next question is the most I think the most open, where, which is not really discussed unless you are working in a large company or you are working in a startup facing everyday challenges. Uh, so this is a very specific question, I think, which Naujot can answer in some way, uh, Rohit and Anand, if you can also answer. Jaydeep, I am surely looking at you in terms of how do you basically, when things break down, if you are, let us, uh, let us assume that majority of the people are using Hadoop stack of some kind, whether pig or the hive or the customer my job was in your case it would be something else no 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 Jyot, i think in your case if it is something else yeah the data cleansing or data basically because it it involves the data flow data ingestion data processing and then data output so there is so it is not like a one one tool which does everything isn't it so i, I think it's a very open ended question so but uh, yeah, I, think I think that that is a fairly open ended question yes. right because part of the reasons why we built some of the tools that we built is to actually do exactly that, right? So now sure. if the question becomes how do you debug and fix those tools, then you do the exact same thing that you built those for, right? Exactly. Eat your own dog food. But uh, I think uh, the, the basic answer always boils down to, you know, it's, it's going to be an intelligence that you have to actually build into the system, right? Not, no, no piece of software that you write, right? be it you know anything you write on top of Hadoop, be it anything you write in Pig, is going to be you know, any easier to debug or fix than anything you wrote you know, perhaps in Java two years ago or perhaps you're writing in Python or anything till you actually build some intelligence into it to, to spit out what those errors are. Right? In terms of specifically how do you debug a Hadoop cluster, I'm not going to venture into that here, right? I'll let the experts probably say, <laughs> uh, take that because I might might get a few things wrong myself, right? Uh, but uh, as far as sort of debugging or uh, let Do me see if I... you have something like, so in PayPal, is there like a Flipkart today, I think they were mentioning they have a huge, uh, or they're building a framework where all events go from whenever things move within their system. So do you have something like yeah, that? Yeah, so we, uh, that, and that's the thing. One of the things that, the one of the biggest sort of those event streams, yes. which gets over 100 billion events a day, is for monitoring. Okay. That is intended to monitor the whole site, right? So now if, and what we do is, we, we base it completely on custom instrumentation, right? We try to drive all of that, all of the sort of common instrumentation in a small set of libraries, right? But again, it's based on instrumentation. Your applications have to tell you what's wrong before you'll know, before that event stream. The event stream itself isn't going to interpret uh, that your application did something wrong or went into unsafe state uh, till there's actually an event in that event stream, right? Uh, so part of the system that, that I was talking about earlier today uh, for command and control is to give us the capability across the site to sort of help us monitor, debug, solve problems in the site, trace a transaction through the entire site, uh, correlate events as they happen uh, across different layers that sort of make up uh, an application. Right? So, so that is one of the systems we built and it's all based on custom instrumentation uh, with primarily the common libraries infrastructure components driving most of that instrumentation. But again, there, there's, I don't think there's a magic bullet if you're talking about okay. just debugging applications, right? Okay. Uh, you either have to instrument them or you know you have to use if if you're using Java for example perhaps you can use bytecode instrumentation which again you know y you you figure out at your scale if it will cause you a problem or not but uh, there's there's only a finite set of techniques right? okay great yeah so, uh, so we have five minutes so sure I'll keep it short yeah. <laughs> 
So on the Hadoop side, Hadoop itself provides the if the mapper fail, fails, it um, you know allows it um, automatically does the you know uh, reallocation for the mappers. But I agree with Navjo saying that you know the application has to be smart enough. So if if your application code is divided into components, which is what uh, Jadi was also mentioning, and each component can you know restart itself from this point where it uh, not necessarily where it failed, but you know from its starting point, so you can maintain the consistency. So if you design your application or the workflow, or the jobs that you are going to either through Uzi or whatever uh, mechanism you have, if you break it down in a way where if it fails, say if there are A, B, C, D, uh, D stage four stages, if the stage B fails, the stage B should be able to start itself from point where it actually picked up after A left. That way you can allow uh, you know that. You know, you don't have to run a monolithic job to start from point A to point D, and there's no restartability. So I think in a design, restartability is the biggest thing because though Hadoop provides a lot of uh, uh, kind of a Check failure points. restart thing, but not necessarily it always works great. So, and since uh, now a lot of community are coming together and you know enhancing it, but if you design your system in a way where it's restartable, I think most of the problems will be solved and only small pieces will be restarted rather than one monolithic. Because if you're reading a petabyte of data, you don't want to keep reading again and again, where you know that after one petabyte you generated 100 terabyte and you're only going to work on 100 terabytes. So. Plus one on the restartability. That's pretty key. Uh, <coughs> the other thing is to fail visibly in the sense. <coughs> Let's say you've got a new product category that's been added. You don't have the metadata or reference data for that. Fine. Don't ignore it. Show it as an unknown category. It's fine to handle all failures, but it's also important equally to show that there has been a failure so that people can take action based on that. It's the only thing I'd add. Yeah, I think the things that come to my mind, uh, um, it's humans who debug problems, and yeah. human beings need logs. So just log everything. Like log the heck out of everything. I mean, that's one thing I uh, appreciated uh, during my work life. Uh, don't worry, like there's enough space, and <laughs> uh, and give people a way to retrieve logs. I mean, that's the number one thing that people uh, users internally used to ask for. You know, just uh, don't build stuff. Just give me like whatever you've run a hundred tasks. Just give me a, give me all the logs. I mean, I've got eyes. I, I'm going to figure out what went wrong. Uh, I found the same thing on my like all the Hadoop sysadmins and stuff. It's like give us a way to get get access to all the logs. You know, we'll figure out the problems. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is that I can add more, you know, in addition to what has already been said, is that uh, a lot of the problems are actually also caused by human beings. Right? It's not actually machine errors or chip failures or whatever thermals that are actually causing most of the problems. Most of the problems happen because people do stupid things. So make your systems idiot proof. Right? That's the other sort of cardinal rule of thumb. Um, prevent people from deleting your entire file system. Uh, prevent them from writing jobs that are going to not finish in like you know whatever like a few days. Uh, don't let them log so much data that uh, uh, they don't allow any other data to come in and everything gets uh, thrown out. So um, uh, what what did they say? Trust but verify, right? Something like that. So like no, don't trust anybody. Like just like <laughs> you know uh, uh, when somebody is a user of your system, put quotas on them. Uh, make sure they don't exceed their quotas. Put those defenses up because if you don't, then a bad user will uh, you know, impact everybody. I think that's the key learning. I think the put the quotas and implementing those quotas from the beginning itself. I, I'm sure it is across all the systems. So, so, so yeah, uh, while, while we are at it, right? So I just wanted to sort of yeah. um, counter one thing. I think I agree th with everything. Uh, so we tell, and a couple of my guys are here, so, so they'll testify. We tell people not to log everything. I right? said, so oh, like, okay. please don't log everything, and don't <laughs> log everything to everywhere, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> because that itself, you know, given the volume we run at, given sort of the the things we have to deal with, that itself can cause problems, right? Yeah, I mean, logging and, too much. And is I think you recognized stupid. at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm in agreement. I mean, I think like we got to exercise judgment here, right? But I think having like critical log, like what Anand said, right? I mean, if you if you're seeing something bad you know, log it, right? I think, but the, the problem, actually I wanted to like follow up on what Anand said, like I mean, part of the issue is that, um, okay, so here's what happens, right? Uh, you, you hire a smart guy, he like develops stuff, uh, he logs everything, he follows the advice, and then he moves on, right? Um, he moves to the other, another project, another company, um, and then nobody's looking at those logs, right? So, so the very common error pattern is, uh, 
yeah, we knew this was happening. Like, we were not joining because we didn't have the joint key or whatever. Like, half the data was missing. But like, nobody was looking at the damn logs, right? So I, I really don't have like an, a good answer to that. I mean, like, the problem is you want to set up alerting, but like, uh, false positives are like one of the biggest problems with any, any alerting system. And like, I haven't seen a good solution. Um, so yeah, there are some unsolved problems. Okay. So yeah, it's a sticky point, but sure. I'll just take a half a minute. I actually am a believer of that log as much as you can, but filter it when you really want to process it. <laughs> Filtering is cheaper on Hadoop, but if you miss the bus, you cannot get that click back if the user clicked. So I think it, according to me in digital space, if you didn't log, you missed an opportunity probably, which is a high cost could be. Thanks. I think that makes sense. So then we have come to the last question, which I hope uh, Anand can first address. And if we have time, that is just, I guess we're just out of the time. So should we stop? Just let's just finish this question then. So I think uh, the question is very straightforward. It's basically when a business analyst at end of the day is trying to make a decision, there is some kind of representation. Either it could be interactive representation or it is a static representation. It could be derived from a lot of in, uh, data or it could be derived from a lot of interaction of data itself. So what has been your experience, and I'm sure it varies across various places, but since Anand is uh, there and we are running out of the sh uh, time, we'll just request Anand to basically take up this one. If there's one piece of advice I'd suggest when you're creating visualizations, it's copy. <laughs> copy blatantly. There are enough good visualizations out there. Just do a scan, search for data visualizations, you'll find enough examples. That's more than enough. If there's a second piece of advice that I'd offer, then it is read Edward Tuft. That's spelled T-U-F-T-E. The person who sort of started data visualization as a, as a revolution. Uh, so, sorry, for those who couldn't hear, the spelling is T-U-F-T-E, Tuft. His books are an amazing source. Uh, beyond that, just remember that the medium that you use to a good extent constrains the work that you do. If you create your visualizations mock-up in PowerPoint, you're likely to be constrained by PowerPoint's shapes. If you create them in Photoshop, you're likely to be constrained by Photoshop styles. Paper and pen works just well, just fine. So you may just want to do a design on paper and pen and see where that takes you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah. You can answer while she gets yeah. Audience question. No, one, one of the things sorry. Uh, one of the things I would like to tell people is and you know, and I agree with you, as people and think of analytics and the tools is the more the charts, the better it looks. The dashboard loaded with pie and pie chart and the trend line and some heat map. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Does it tell you the story? Does it lead you to the question and the answer that you're looking for? I think if your dashboard or a visualization does not tell you the story, like, you know, on the back of your T-shirt tells you the story, then I think, uh, I don't know whether the visualization makes any sense. Uh, uh, so my question is uh, pretty basic, basically. Uh, is there a best practice for uh, storing data uh, somewhat neatly in Hadoop? Uh, for example, say I have a uh, large log file that uh, basically contains unstructured data, but I can easily identify that there are uh, 10 different sets of unstructured data, unstructured data of 10 types. So is it uh, a good practice to like run that log file through a parser and then store it in 10 different directories in Hadoop? Or should I all uh, just dump that big file in a Hadoop directory and let Hadoop uh, handle that? Sure. Joy, did you want to say or I can? I, I think uh, your answer will ultimately depend. I mean, the, the cardinal rule of the thumb is that if you are going to divide the data, then like look at uh, how fine-grained data you are creating, right? So, I mean, let's take the um, sort of the um, uh, trivial or, or rather uh, one extreme of the case. Okay. Uh, there is a record per user. Am I supposed to store one rec like one file per user? And obviously the answer is not, right? So there is always a you know it's a fine line, right? So you've got to look at how fine grained your data sets you're producing. If it's really really fine grained, go for a you know system that indexes like HBase or one of those kind kind of systems. Uh, if they are still relatively coarse grained, then you know yeah, split into directories. Uh, make sure your directories are big enough. So. Uh if, if you, because you're talking specific about logs, right? Uh, I assume that logs are not directly storable and queryable because that's, that's not how you log. So you have to think about how you're going to use your data going forward. It, because if you store it in a certain way and you're going to use it in a different way, 
and every time you'll end up reading all the data but and then filtering out some of the data, then definitely you didn't store it right. If you can come up that most of the use cases that you have for using the data can be sufficed with a particular design, then that that is the right way to there is no thumb rule saying that store it like this. Like you said, if you need lookup kind of a thing that you got the log and you just need to show as a real time analytics, you just take it, you know, use whatever stream processing is and dump it in HBase and show it. But definitely there's more. So the performance difference, like I said, you know, if you're getting every day, say, 50 terabyte of data, right? And you're storing it in a way where you will only read, say, 100 gigabyte of it for whatever. Say you are doing a geo analysis. And most of your use cases is only geo analysis because you are a company which mostly talks about the geo part. Then you should store it, uh, you know, from a geographic way of it because then you can in produce independent analytics. But if you are going to do a real time analysis, like, okay, you know, how many clicks happened now? Tell me in five minutes what happened. You know, did this advertiser get this user and stuff like that? And that you do a stream processing and store it in edge space, right? So it purely depends on what use cases you have. Otherwise, it's all blob, you know, like someone was mentioning, I think you know, the data is boring to look at. Unless it tells a story. So. Yeah, <coughs> this is not a question. This is a clarification. Uh, as we understand, you know, there is a difference in the way we are looking the structured data and unstructured data in the industry. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is that how? What is the industry trend in terms of processing the unstructured data to the structured data? Okay, could you repeat the question, please? The Basically last part. The what is the industry trend in terms of you know processing the unstructured data to structured data? Because okay. the kind of unstructured data volume is almost two times than of the structured data, right? So, so unstructured data is used to derive some information which is human readable, which has to be structured data. So, almost every data that you process, when the output comes, has to be structured. Uh, so structured data is always there 100% of the time. Unstructured data is used to make sense so that you can look at, like for example, if you are getting messages like at Facebook, right? They are unstructured, but when you do the text analytics of it and you do a geography analysis, and then you can make out that, okay, in California, this particular theme is really popular, right? That's structured information, right? Because then you can represent it. But the thing is, to pro you have to if you have unstructured data, you have to process it and eventually a structured information has to come out of it. One of, the, one of the interesting things that's happening as a result of needing to process unstructured data is a confluence between science and technology. You know, <laughs> the kinds of unstructured data that we are processing are text, video, audio, images and so on. Now, <laughs> sound engineers have been processing sound in various ways over the years and there are startups today for instance that take this spectro audio spectrogram of songs and try and see if they can predict similar songs. People are doing that for images using uh, visual recognition techniques. We are taking the techniques of linguistics which is as far removed from technology as one could imagine and applying that to uh, <coughs> extract structured data. So what are the side effects or have the drivers of uh, structuring unstructured data is also this confluence or bringing in new insights from science from fairly diverse fields. Just a footnote. Hi, uh, I'm pretty new to uh, NoSQL. So in RDBMS, we had the uh, I mean paradigm of normalization and entity relationship modeling. Do we have any such paradigm in NoSQL? I mean, how do we model our data in NoSQL? No I guess world? we'll have to take that question. Do you want to take that question now? Or yeah, please. So I, I think in my profile I have mentioned that you know we have implemented a star model on grid. Uh, so what we did is the files that you have on grid, you can call it as a table. The, the information that you have within the file, whether it's structured or you can write a UDF to identify the columns. So you call it as a column. And then um, define the relationship between the two feeds. If you have a one feed of a user, another feed of an advertiser, and for whatever reason you want to say, find out whether this cookie clicked on this ad, then you know that the, the link is a cookie between an advertiser and the, ad, ad, and the user, right? So if you represent this as a meta information, maybe it in your MySQL or anything, you then do a star modeling, use any tool, or you can write your own custom tool where you allow people to think in a dimension and metric form, drag and drop in your UI, 
Internally, it will know the which feeds and which columns it's talking about and how they need to be joined. If it's a small file, you do map side join, or if it's a you know big file, it's on the reduce side. So stuff like that, then you can implement it. But it's a hack. It's not still like an SQL fired and got the data. It will still be a bash thing unless you implement something like a cube on HBase. Then then you can actually play with the Java APIs of the HBase. Can we take last two questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. I'm basically trying to collect some open problems. So, but uh, so, what are some problems that are well solved in the batch processing or offline mode space? For example, like a, a typical Hadoop kind of a scenario, and would make sense in an online and a real-time uh, scenario, but are difficult to solve. Or uh, you guys are basically grappling with things that you know problems that would really add value if solved in a real-time scenario, but are hard to solve and maybe they are solved uh, already in the uh, batch processing space. So, uh, yeah, it's on. So any, any real-time analytics capability, right? I think it's, it's uh, early to say that real-time analytics of, of very large data sets is solved. I think, for example, the problems like in the life sciences, right, in biology, things like that, finding those implicit relationships in real time, uh, I don't believe it, you can call them solved yet, right? Uh, especially as, as the data sets increase, as the volume increases, as sort of the dynamic nature of it increases, right? Uh, so I, I want to keep adding more events while you're doing your processing, and I want you to keep, keep revising the answer you give me. Uh, I don't believe that's solved yet, right? and I think that's a common problem that everybody here here has uh, uh, that's sitting up here, and I think most of you will have if you're sitting out there. So one of the things I would like to actually ask question when when you know even in Yahoo when people say I want real time analytics, I said what will you do with it, and they say you know what it will help me to tell advertiser that you can bid here more. I said, how long does your system take to make that change and push it to the survey? Say it takes two hours. I said, you're not qualifying for real-time analytics. The real-time analytics usually can help in more like a machine learning, where, for example, if I'm generating a user value or you know, constantly tracking how the user behavior is changing, and for example, suddenly I see some news broke out and interest started happening, that is when if I have a real-time analytics and I can feed into the system, which automatically can make sense out of it and pushes out more content to that user, that is real-time analytics. A human consuming real-time, even if the numbers say suddenly became 20 million to 40 million users, good deal, big thing, so what? You know, if you can't answer this question, that you can take action on it and uh, Anand can uh, watch more of it. If analytics has no action related to it, it's an information dump. It's it's code dump for programmer. Maybe add. I, th I think this is getting away from the. Is it, uh, <laughs> code dump. Huh? Hello. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're back online. All right. So I, I, so okay. So. I was in Ritz camp. Uh, I'm no longer there. <laughs> the reason is that when people pay for stuff, they ask for stuff, and whether it makes sense or not, you have to give it to them, right? <laughs> so <laughs> when your, <laughs> you know, when your advertisers come and they are paying you money for like because you show ad get the clicks, they say, yeah, Google Analytics does real-time analytics. Why aren't you doing it? Right? What are you gonna say? Like take your money to Google? Right? So you gotta do what customers say. I've, I've seen that even from like. Very small, you know, I, I remember talking to this uh, online help desk company and they are serving mom and pop shops. And their mom and pop shops are asking them for real time analytics on their customer logs or whatever, right? I mean like, yeah, what are they going to do with it? But you know, they are paying customers. You have got to give them what they want, right? Uh, the, what was the second part? So, so actually your question was open unsolved problems, right? Um, so I, 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 you know, I, I think there's so much stuff going on in the world that it's very hard to claim that you know you actually know what's going on and that you know what's unsolved and not. But um, the, the 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 one thing that I, I you know if you if you develop this you know I would be a happy customer would be um, uh, there are real time systems that do very good job of processing low latency uh, you know um, 
high number of like transactions per second kind of data. And there are these batch systems that obviously you know can go ch chunking on six months worth of data. I haven't seen a good abstraction or a you know a, a layer that says, um, yeah, you can define these real time counters, and if you tell me to actually back populate them six months, I'm going to just do it for you. You don't have to worry about it, right? So. Uh, if somebody in the audience actually knows a class of system that does that, I'll be very happy to know. But w where I have seen systems break down is the real the guys who build real time systems. They focus on the real time part. The guys who do the batch systems they focus on the batch part. And nobody tries to span like from the end user's point of view. I don't care, right? I just want my real time analytics starting now and going back six months. And please give it to me. So that I mean that might be something interesting hopefully. Um, some of you are suppliers of data analytics. Even though I'm from a different field, I'm an educational researcher, one of my toughest issues has actually been to get people to use data. So as suppliers, how do you generate a demand for your product? <laughs> I completely agree with you, first of all. I, I, st I still think, I, th I think that's the fundamental problem that we face in a lot of businesses still where people really have a problem but cannot relate it back to data or analytics and how it can be solved. So I think there's a huge education process, at least as a startup, most of the cases where we go and work, I think they, we have to educate businesses saying, you know, if we do this, this is the value that you can generate. This is probably the final revenue enhancement or cost takeout that can come in. By the way, what goes in it is analytics. So and this is the solution that we try to provide you. So, so it's an education process. It can be easier if you can have some prototypes, if you can visualize the whole thing and show it, if you have some real uh, case studies where you have done it, makes it more real. Uh, but uh, uh, going back to that whole thing, I think even before you start a pro project, many of the times you have to build in a visualization which explains to the client that how they can uh, get value out of what they are trying to do. And Anand, I'm sure you want to uh, it's pro it probably also needs a change in mindset. You're not getting them to consume data. You want them to consume stories. That's what's more interesting. And that's therefore also a change in mindset for the people that are pushing this out. Don't push out data, push out stories. And that therefore means training on the part of the data analysts to learn how to tell stories. The story could be numbers, it could be a simple statement, <coughs> it could be in pictures, it could be even a table of numbers at the end of the day. But let's just recognize that at the end of the day, you don't want to say the chi-square value of this is 7.3. You want to say Jack and Jill went up the hill, no? something of that kind, or down the hill. Okay, I think we're done. Great, thank you so much, thank you uh, so much Bowen. The panel Thanks for the panelists. Thank that was excellent. Yeah. I'll see you guys tomorrow.